These images are of the rarest dingoes on earth. They're known as the big desert dingo ecotype and they're found in the far western deserts of Victoria in Australia. And the footage you're about to see is the first ever footage of these animals behaving naturally in the wild. They're incredibly elusive and very, very difficult to see, let alone film. And this little documentary, story, whatever you want to call it, is uh, an informative piece about these animals and what's so remarkable about them and a little bit about how I was able to get this footage. So come with me on the journey and I'll share as much as I can. Hey everyone, my name is Daniel Hunter and I'm a professional wildlife cinematographer and ecosystem biologist here in Australia. And this is my new YouTube channel called Field Unknown, so welcome. Uh, this is obviously my first video and this channel will be dedicated to sharing stories about Australian wildlife in particular and some of the science around it and also um, going on adventures and filming Australian wildlife and trying to uncover new and interesting behaviours and information and sharing as much as I can about the process and the stories behind our incredible wildlife. So it'll be a mix of uh, filmmaking, uh, adventure, uh, science. So yeah, if this interests you, come along for the ride and hit subscribe. I want to get straight into it with one of my favourite stories from the last few years and that is the story of the big desert dingoes in Western Victoria. And they're located in a very remote part of the state of Victoria here in Australia. Uh, and if you're not from Australia, it's one of the most southern states. It's, um, it's capital city is Melbourne and that's where, where I live. And um, Big Desert is about seven, eight hours away from Melbourne, a seven or eight hour drive. And um, it's, uh, yeah, as I said, very remote. It's a semi-arid, arid, arid um, area. It's what's known as a wilderness area. So um, it's absolutely enormous. Flora and fauna that exists in there is able to carry on living, you know, the way they would if sort of humans weren't interfering. So it's, they're really cool places. They're really special and they're amazing for, uh, you know, people like us that love to experience nature and wildlife and uh, try and imagine what it was like before humans were sort of interfering with, um, with ecosystems, I guess. So the national park is, is very remote and I headed out there uh, basically to, to try and um, learn some more about these big desert dingoes. And to give you a little bit of background about these animals, um, I think it's important to start with um, a bit about dingoes. And I won't go into dingoes too much right now because I think there's probably more than enough room to do some dedicated videos on dingoes and I'm very keen to do that. But uh, I guess a short synopsis is that dingoes uh, exist pretty much Australia-wide. They are very successful opportunistic animals. They've, they've covered most of Australia's habitats and they do quite well. Um, but they are removed from large areas of Australia because they're considered an agricultural pest. So being a predator, they eat other animals, obviously. Um, much like, say, wolves in North America and Europe, uh, they will attack livestock from time to time. And because of this, livestock producers uh, actively are at war with dingoes and will poison bait them, trap them and shoot them. Uh, and this is obviously no good for the dingoes. And it means that they've been removed from these uh, very large grazing areas. And as you're probably aware, Australia has enormous um, areas of land dedicated to livestock production. So that doesn't really work well with dingoes and that's something that I've been um, spending a large part of my career trying to understand and sort of um, help the dingoes conservation plight because um, dingoes are actually incredibly important for uh, biodiversity in Australia. So we've established that. Um, what's so special about these big desert dingoes? Well, the big desert dingoes are isolated. They're effectively like an island population. If you look at a map of the big desert, it's surrounded by livestock production area and the dingoes remaining in there are completely isolated. They're not able to interact with dingoes on the east coast or the west coast because of that farmland barrier around them. And that's meant over years that the dingoes in there have become 
uh, sort of genetically um, uh, isolated. From a genetic point of view, it's meant that they're actually very remarkable. They're, they're, they've become what's known in um, the biology field as an ecotype. They're almost like their own subspecies of dingoes. And so they've become very important and genetically distinct from the rest of the dingoes in Australia. So from my point of view, these dingoes needed to be filmed and um, I was asked by a, a team of people to basically go and film them who were uh, affiliated with um, an Australian dingo organisation and a university. I knew that these dingoes were going to be very challenging to film. There wasn't an easy place to find their prey like kangaroos or wallabies in one area and it's such an enormous area, very difficult to, to, to move around through the landscape, it's very sandy, it's even hard to drive. So. It was going to be a challenge to film them. And once I linked up with Leash, the first question I asked her basically was, are there any remaining water points in this wilderness area? And she racked her mind and she remembered that there was actually one remaining water point that had become very stagnant, but there was some water there. And basically I knew that was gonna be uh, my best bet at filming these animals, was setting up my hide by the water point and waiting. And, um, that's exactly what I did. And I found the closest road uh, that I could get my car and hide and camera to, which was about a three kilometre hike away from the water point. And I pulled up and uh, walked in and set up my canvas hide and waited. And I did this for about seven days. And I'll tell you a little bit more about how it ensued. So I was set up in my hide on this really warm first morning and these beautiful bronze wings came down to drink at the waterhole where I was waiting for the dingoes just before the light had become good. And then all of a sudden this first young juvenile stalked out of the bush with this beautiful dark face and these long white socks. And I was absolutely blown away because I knew this was a really important moment. This was some of the first ever footage of these animals. And it was wary but it needed a drink, it was really warm and it came down and it could probably smell me and maybe see my hide, but it wasn't overly cautious. It came down and, and, and just kept walking along the cracked earth towards the last little bit of this remnant water and I was so excited and it came down and, and just drank away at this muddy little pond and I was, I was so elated to see it with these gorgeous golden eyes and um, the camera was shaking a little bit, as you can see. I was, I was just chuffed. Such beautiful animals. And then not long after, this other one came out, which looked quite similar, but he didn't stay long. But then came back not long after with his, what is a little brother or sister, probably. And they, they ran out and were playing together. They were really excited. And they were keen to come and have a drink as well, which was really cool. Um, and they had a little drink and, and then sort of played together for a little bit and, and walked off. Uh, and then he, this one, one of the pair came back out and had another drink and, and sort of stood around looking all regal and beautiful. And so lovely. Oh, I, I saw this big brew as well, this big male western grey kangaroo in the bushes, uh, which was really interesting. And then what happened was as this dingo came to drink at the water, this big grey roux kind of hopped in to sort of spook him off, which they can definitely do. This, these male roux are huge. And this, this dingo puppy sort of ran, ran back, was a little bit fearful. And I was pretty excited, because I was like, oh, what's gonna go down here? I mean, it's not likely that this dingo pump, pup could sort of actually attack this roux, but uh, you'll see that it began chasing it. It's kind of playful. The chase, you can see it's kind of lopy and boundy and, and I knew that it couldn't actually, you know, tackle or kill this roo, but it was a really cool piece of behavior to see. And I was quite excited about that. Um, oh, this moment was cool. This little pup ran up to what must have been its mum or dad or older sibling and it bites it on the face, the older one, but it, it's a very gentle bite. It's a, it's a dominance display. And the young pump now sort of cowers and 
um, enters a sort of submissive sequence of behaviours which is um, very similar to what wolves do and it shows that they're very clever animals and very social animals with strong pack dynamics. Oh, this moment I love. This, this was a, a really old male, a black male who's actually gone white or grey on the face and he, he sort of gave away this sort of defensive um, barky howl type, type sound. And I'm really sad I, I couldn't actually record the audio on this. I was so far away with my long lens. Um, and I think the reason he was barking or howling was to warn this younger pup who was much less wary and not aware of sort of the potential danger in me. Obviously, I wasn't dangerous, but the, the dingoes didn't know that. And he kind of howled to alert this younger one, perhaps a son or a grandson or granddaughter, to um, you know my, uh, my presence. But the pup couldn't really see me. You can see it looking around there. And then, and then, they, then this, then the older one starts going into this sneezing fit, which is really interesting. And I was kind of worried for it for a bit there, um, but uh, you know, it didn't seem to to phase ultimately. Um, and the young pup's kind of looking around for me, and then spotted me there. You can see sniffing the air, um, and sort of walks in to get a closer look. And the, the older one still drooling and coughing and sneezing in the background and uh, the pup comes in looking really stunning in this nice morning light and the old male gives a howl and walks off and, and the young pup uh, knows better and follows grandpa and heads away. People used to say that if a dingo wasn't that classic sandy colour that you see on Gari or Fraser Island or in the desert areas of Australia that it wasn't actually a pure dingo but we now know from the latest scientific studies that that is uh, objectively not true that a purebred dingo can be white, black, uh, sable, tan uh, or any any of those colors in between uh, and I've filmed you know white dingoes in in the high country, black dingoes in the forest it, it does not matter what the color of the the animal's coat is that does not uh, allow anyone to determine the purity of dingoes and um, you know some of the most recent science that's come out has shown that in Victoria over 90% of dingoes are actually 100% pure and uh, some of those uh, remaining 10% are either feral dogs so just dogs actually gone wild whether they're hunting dogs or dogs that have been lost or etc and and a smaller percentage of that are um, uh, you know, wild dogs, dogs that have um, interbred with dingoes. But the fact is that wild dogs are far fewer in number than we, we people first thought. But it, the wild dog agenda is still being pushed and I'm really keen to dispel that myth as much as possible. So this little video has just been a, a, little, um, a little story, I guess, about some of uh, my experiences filming these big desert dingoes. And... Um, I found it really enjoyable. It was really beautiful to see some of these animals behaving naturally in the wild and watch their interactions. And I'm really pleased that I was able to document them. Um, you know, who knows what's going to happen to them in the next five, 10, 20 years. Um, the laws are against, against them and, and there's a big push to persecute dingoes Australia-wide. So I found it really enjoyable to be able to document them and, and, and hopefully build up their profile a little bit. And that is one of the reasons why I wanted to share this video. Um, but I think that's it for now. And I just wanted to say thanks for joining me on my very first YouTube video. And um, if, you, if you enjoyed these videos and you wanna see more, you've got comments about this one, uh, what you might like to see next time, please let me know in the comments. I'm really keen to engage with any potential audience and um, yeah, make more of these going forward. So thanks again and I'll see you.